Amen. Thank you. Have a Good morning. Man, it's great to see everyone here this morning. If you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 25 in just a few minutes. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can pick one up in the pew in front of you, or you can look at the screen. I'll be putting a lot of the scriptures up on the screen as well. For those of you who are visiting with us today, or for those of you who have been unable to be here for the last couple of weeks, right now we're in the middle of a series entitled One Another. And what we're doing in this series is we're just looking at several of the different one another passages in Scripture. For example, in week number one, we looked at John chapter 13, where Jesus calls us to love one another. And then last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus calls all of us to forgive one another. And so today, we're going to add to that. We're going to look at another one another phrase, but before we do that, let me say this, okay? I want you to keep this in mind before we begin with our lesson today. The one another phrase that we're going to be looking at today is found in Scripture more than any other one another phrase. In other words, what we're going to be talking about today is very, very important to God because we see it so much. In Scripture. So I don't want you to take this lightly today. But look at Hebrews chapter 10. This is our text, 19 through 25. It says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and lit life giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest, who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep His promises." In other words, what the Hebrew writer is saying, because of what Jesus did, because of His death, because of the blood that He shed on our behalf, now we can be cleansed. Now we can be washed in not just our physical bodies, but our consciences. So that now, you and I, we can do what other people couldn't do before, and that is, we can come into the very presence of God. Amen? That's awesome. Because of what Jesus did, you and I now, we no longer have to go through a priest. We no longer um, have to uh, go and, and you know get someone to go on our behalf before God. Now, we ourselves, we as Christians can come into the very presence of God. And so he says, okay, keep reading. In light of that, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But what, church? Encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. There was a journalist who did an interview with a very successful entrepreneur. And really this interview was how he became so successful. And so the man began by saying, well, my wife and I, when we first got married, we only had a nickel to our name. And he said, I went out and I took that nickel and I bought an apple. And he said, I took that apple and I shined it up and I polished it up really good and I ended up selling it for 10 cents. And then he said, I went out and I bought two more apples and I shined them up and I polished them up, making those apples look really good. And I went out and I ended up selling those two apples for 20 cents. And then he said, I went out and I bought four more apples. And the, the guy who's doing the interview, the journalist, is sitting there thinking to himself, this is absolutely amazing. I mean, this is, this is such an amazing human interview. 
interest story. And he's on the edge of his seat. And finally he says, what happens next? And the guy says, well, he says, my father-in-law died and he left us $50 million. Here's the question. Why do we get so excited when we hear stories about other people's success? And the answer is really very simple. We're all wired to want to be inspired. Right? I mean, we want to be inspired to, to be more, to, to do more. But unfortunately, today we live in a world where we are bombarded with news and, bar and bombarded with propaganda that is so depressing and so discouraging. And so the question is this, where can we go to be lifted up? Where can we go to be inspired and encouraged in a broken world? And the Hebrew writer here in our text, he tells us, he says, you go to church. You gather with the very ones who had been cleansed and had been washed by the blood of Jesus. Those of you who have been encouraged by the gospel story. It is your calling to go out and encourage others. But so oftentimes, that's not necessarily the way it is, right? But this should be a place of encouragement. It kind of reminds me of the Duke of Wellington. Some of you know from history that the Duke of Wellington was actually the one who de defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. Now, what you may not know is that the Duke of Wellington was very brilliant, but he was also, they say, very demanding. And so, on one occasion, towards the end of his life, someone asked him, if you could do it all over again, what is one thing that you would do differently? And this is what he said. I would give out more praise. Listen, as Christians, we are to be praise givers. Or to put it another way, we are to be consistent. We are to be intentional encouragers. In fact, as I said in the very beginning, one of the things that we are asked to do more than anything else is to encourage one another. In fact, if you look at that word in the Scripture, encourage, it's found some 109 times in the New Testament. How many of you think God's trying to tell us something here? 109 times. It talks about encouragement, and that word actually means to come alongside someone. And it's also used to describe all those things that we do and we say that inspires and encourages and builds other Christians up. And what's really cool is we see examples of this all through the Bible. Acts chapter 14, for example, verses 21 through 22, it says they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples. And what did they do, church? Encouraging them to remain true to the faith. If you flip over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. What church? Encouraging, comforting, urging you to live lives of worthiness of God who calls you into His kingdom and glory. And so as we look at the Scripture, we have example after example after example of the, the early church leaders encouraging others. But here's the deal. It's not just the leaders who are to encourage. 
Now that's, that's very important. That's very necessary. Leaders should be encouragers. But notice what Paul writes to the whole church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. He tells the church there, Therefore, what church? Encourage one another and what? Build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Now let me add to this. Because this is something we really need to discuss. Spirit-led encouragement isn't just giving people compliments. I mean, so oftentimes we come to church and we say to people, oh, I love your hair. None of y'all have ever said that to me, but... I love your hair and I love your dress and, and you did so good with the Scripture reading this morning. But encouragement goes deeper than that. Look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. It says, But encourage one another daily as long as it is being called today so that none of you may be hardened by white church, by sin's deceitfulness. And so as we come together and we see someone who may be heading down the wrong path, or we see someone who is really struggling spiritually as Christians, we are to speak into that. We are to encourage them to come back to the Lord. Or we are to encourage them to stay committed and to keep pushing forward. The Bible tells us that we're constantly to exhort, warn, and urge people in their walk with Jesus. And again, let me remind you, the reason for that is because we live in a very depressing, discouraging world. And so we need that. We need each other cheering each other on. I, I heard a story one time in, in Reader's Digest. Um, there was a Navy frog guy who got married. And he told his new wife, he said, You know, I really don't think your mom likes me. And she said, well, why would you even think that? And he said, well, I was trying to explain to your mom that when I dive, when I'm scuba diving, I don't wear my wedding ring on my finger because Barracuda likes shiny objects and I could actually lose a finger. And he said, your mom told me, well, then why don't you take your wedding ring and put it on a chain around your neck? <laughs> Some of you understand that. We live in a world that can be very, very discouraging. And one of the chief purposes of what we're doing today, assembling together, is mutual encouragement. Listen, to come to worship, and then to just get up, and never say anything to anyone... To never ask anyone how they're doing or, or is, there, is there any way that I can help you in some way. Let me tell you something. If we just walk out of here and we're not encouraging others, we've missed it, guys. Because here's the deal, and I believe Wesley Leonard said this uh, not too long ago on a Wednesday night. Listen, we can come and worship God, right? And, and, or we can just stay home and we can do that in our closets. But when we come together, we're to encourage. Now some of you say, well, Slate, I'm not real good at that. No. I get it. Some are better at encouraging than others. But I think all of us have a desire to be better, right? And so let me share with you three things that I think we need to know in order to be better encouragers. First of all, we've got to get rid of self-absorption. And I think probably most of you get this, that our flesh gravitates to this, well, it's all about me mentality. I mean, that's the world in which we live in. But that doesn't inspire 
and encourage anyone, does it? In fact, we're inspired when someone puts we above me. I don't know how many of you remember this back in 2012 in the Olympic Games in London. The U.S. had an American 4x4 team running in the preliminaries. And the guy who actually started out the first leg was a guy by the name of Monteo Mitchell. And, and some of you may remember this story. Monteo started out and he gets 200 meters into this 400 meter race and his leg breaks. It's not fractured, it's not cracked, his leg breaks. And at that point, he has to make a decision. Is he going to stop and tend to himself? Or is he going to keep running? And let me remind you that these are the preliminaries, right? This, this isn't even the finals. And, and if by some chance he is to keep running and his team goes on to the finals, guess what? He's not going to get to be a part of that team because his leg is now broken. And so how many of you would say he had a good reason to just stop and think about himself? But instead, he keeps running so that his team could run again the next day. And he said the whole time he was running, he said three things to himself. Faith, focus, and also, let me find it, finish. He said, I kept saying that to myself. Faith, focus, and finish. And get this, he ran the 400 meters in 46 seconds on a broken leg so that his team could run again. As Christians, we've got to realize that we're not the only ones in the race. We've got to keep that at the forefront of our mind. And, and I think there's a great example of this in Philemon 7. Paul is writing to Philemon, and this is what he says, Your love has given me great joy and what, church? Encouragement. Why? Because you, brother, have what? Refreshed the hearts of who? The Lord's people. In other words, Philemon was not about himself. He was about those he was running with. He was all about refreshing his brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to decide... Does Jesus know what He's talking about when He says that the key to self-fulfillment is self-denial or not? What do we believe? How many of you would say, man, I want joy and I want fulfillment in my life? Then let me tell you something. That doesn't begin with you putting you first. And we have to make up our mind to do that every single day to get rid of this self-absorption if we are truly going to be encouragers. Secondly, we got to get rid of individualism. And this is so hard for us because we live in a country today that holds independence as a virtue, right? But here's the deal. Independence is not a virtue in the kingdom of God. I know sometimes, and some of you can probably relate to this, sometimes on the Christian radio station you'll hear songs about how God is all we need. And as we've said before, that's not really biblical. 
God Himself says, look, I'm not all you need. Listen, you also need others. We need each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. I know our walk with God is to be personal, but it was never to be private. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, listen to how Paul words this to the church at Thessalonica. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. What church? Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. Now why did Paul write this? Because Paul knows that the church is full of people who want to be everything that God wants them to be. But here's the deal. They are never going to be that. if they don't have someone come alongside them and help them in their walk with Jesus. Nobody becomes all they can be in Christ by themselves. I don't know where I'd be today without my wife. I don't know where I'd be without so many of you who encourage me and inspire me to be better. We all need someone to help us to achieve greatness. Now, I want to share with you a video this morning that I've shared I think one other time. It's actually one of my favorite scenes from one of my favorite movies. And so if you guys will put that up, it's, it's kind of lengthy, it's about five minutes long, but I think you guys will get the message. Uh, hey, that's not even funny, dude. Go ahead. So, Coach, how strong is Westview this year? A lot stronger than we are. You already written Friday night down as a loss, Brock? Well, not if I know we could beat them. Come here, Brock. You too, Jeremy. What, am I in trouble now? Not yet. I want to see you do the death crawl again, except I want to see your absolute best. <laughs> <laughs> what, you want me to go to the 30? I think you can go to the 50. The 50? I can go to the 50 if nobody's on my back. I think you can do it with Jeremy on your back. But even if you can, I want you to promise me you're going to do your best. All right. Your best. OK. You going to give me your best? I'm going to give you my best. All right, one more thing. I want you to do it blindfolded. Why? Because I want you giving up at a certain point when you can go further. Get down. Jeremy, get on his back. <laughs> I get a good tight hold, Jeremy. All right, let's go, Brock. Keep your knees off the ground, just your hands and feet. There you go. A little bit left. A little bit left. I bet he does it. There you go, baby. There you go. Show me good effort. That way, Brock. You keep coming. There you go. It's a good start. A little bit left. A little bit left. There you go, Brock. Good strength. That's it, Brock. That's it. Not the 20 yet. Forget the 20. You give me your best. You keep going. That's it. No, don't stop, Brock. You got more in you than that. I ain't done. I'm just resting a second. You got to keep moving. Let's keep moving. Let's go. Don't quit till you got nothing left. There you go. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. You keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving it. Your very best. Your very best. Your very best. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's it. Keep going. Don't quit on me. Keep going. Keep driving it. Keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. That's it. Your very best. Don't quit on me. Your very best. Keep driving. Keep driving. There you go. There you go. That's it. You keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving it. Don't quit till you got nothing left. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's it. Keep going. I want everything you got. Come on. Keep going. It hurts. Don't quit on me. Your very best. Keep driving. Keep driving. There you go. There you go. He's heavy. I know I'm, he's heavy. 
I'm buying out of strength. Then you negotiate with your body to find more strength, but don't you give up on me, Brock. You keep going, you hear me? You keep going, you're doing good, you keep going. Do not quit on me, you keep going. It hurts. I know it hurts, you keep going, you keep going. It's all hard from here. 30 more steps, you keep going, Brock. Come on, keep going. Burn. And let it burn. It's, burning. it's all hard. You keep going, Brock. Come on, come on, keep going. You promised me your best. You're back! Don't stop! Keep going! Too hard! It's not too hard! You keep going! Come on, Brock! Give me more! Give me more! Keep going! 20 more steps! 20 more! Keep going, Brock! Give me your best! Don't quit! No! Keep going! Keep going! Keep going! Don't quit! Don't quit! Don't quit! Brock Kelly, you don't quit! Keep going! Keep going! Go, Brock Kelly! You don't quit on me! No, you keep going! You keep going! Go, Brock! Ten more steps! Ten more! Ten more! Ten more! Keep going! Don't quit! Give me your heart! You can! You can! Five more! Five more! Come on, Brock! Come on! Don't quit! Don't quit! Come on, Brock! Two more! Look up, Brock. You're in the end zone. Brock, you are the most influential player on this team. If you walk around defeated, so will they. Oh, tell me you can't give me more than what I've been seeing. You just carried a 140-pound man across this whole field on your arms. Brock, I need you. God's gifted you with the ability of leadership. Don't waste it. Coach? Can I count on you? Yes. Coach? What is it, Jeremy? I weigh 160. And I love that part in the movie because it challenges me to ask myself how far would that young man have gotten without his coach? Without someone cheering him on? Without someone encouraging him, telling him that he could do it? And that's why this is so important that we gather together. That's, that's why I believe our small groups are so important. It's gatherings like that that help us to become more than we are. To help us to become more like who Jesus wants us to become. I think about our shut-in worship today. There'll be many of us who'll be going out and we'll be taking worship to those who can't be here with us. You know, I think so oftentimes we take this for granted. But if we were only in the position that some of these folks are in the nursing home and some of these people who are shut in at their homes and they can't get out and they can't engage with others and brothers and sisters in Christ, I think about how hard that would be. But as we go out and we go into the homes of these people, the encouragement that it brings them by us being there. Because we can't do this life by ourselves. We need each other. Sure, we can, we can practice our faith in isolation, and, and, and we can practice our hope in a, in a closet, but we cannot practice love and encouragement without a family. Christians encourage community. And Christians come to community in order to encourage. 
And then lastly, we've got to get rid of cheap grace. You know, you go back to the text, Hebrews chapter 10, and you look at the context of what the Hebrew writing is saying. It's through the blood of Jesus, guys, that we can come into the very presence of God. We have been made holy by His loving sacrifice. And what the Hebrew writer is saying here is that our response to that encouraging gospel should be to encourage others. We behave the way we behave because we believe what we believe. And we believe that grace is free. But it's not cheap. God does more than just forgive our sins. Grace forms a new kind of people. I love the way the Living Bible reads Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. It says, in response to all He has done for us, in response, let us outdo each other in being helpful and kind to each other and in doing good. That's our response. Because of what Jesus did for us, the sacrifice that was made on our behalf, our response is to encourage others. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we now get to partner with Him in building up people from who, for whom He has died. In other words, we have all been chosen to be cheerleaders. But we haven't just been chosen, we've been empowered to be cheerleaders. Jesus sent the encourager to live inside us. John chapter 14 verse 16 says, I will ask the Father and He will give you another white church counselor. Now some of your translations say encourager because that's what it means. To help you and be with you forever. You see, God has given us the ultimate encourager to live in us. And the question is why? Well, to encourage us, but also to empower us to be able to encourage each other. And I want to see a show of hands this morning because I want to see, I want to make sure everybody sees this. How many of you need encouragement at times? And I don't know about you, but I'll close out with this. I want to be like this guy by the name of Tychicus that Paul is writing the church at Colossae about. He says in Colossians 4 verse 8, he says, I'm sending him, that's Tychicus, to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may what, church? encourage your hearts. I don't know about you, but I want to be like that guy. I want to be like the guy who God says, you know what, I know of some people who need some encouragement, and so Slate, you're my boy. Slate, you are my man, because you are an encourager. And I'm probably not near that yet, but I want to be. There may be some of you here this morning who need some encouragement. And as a family, we would love to pray with you. As a family, it might be that some of us might even share with you some of the things that we've been through. And even the fact that as we went through those things, we had a God who was there to see us through and encourage us. And that's what we're called to do as we read the text this morning, the opening passage of Scripture, 
that God comforts us in, in our times of trouble so that we can encourage others or, or comfort others as they go through similar things. And so if you need some encouragement this morning, let me tell you, as a church family, we would love to share some encouragement with you. Maybe we would encourage you by telling you about Jesus. The fact that Jesus sacrificed His life so that all our sins could be forgiven. And as we said, so that we can come into the very presence of God. That's encouraging. And so it may be that some of you need to hear about Jesus today. We'd love to sit down and study with you and tell you more about the awesome Savior that we have. But whatever the case may be, we want to give you the opportunity to respond. Who then is this? He's not what we thought. Who is this? Because it's that question that helps us to move in our faith. Even disciples do not have perfect faith. But these moments are supposed to be there for us. It draws us back to Israel being delivered at the Red Sea. Yahweh saves them through the mighty works over nature. And it says in Exodus 14 and verse 31, he says, Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. This is the Red Sea. So the people feared the Lord. But notice, and they believed in the Lord. The question is, will these disciples believe Will they be able to say, as the psalmist, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. And he says, though the waters roar and foam. Folks, this is not a guarantee that there's no chaos in our lives. It's quite the opposite. It's quite the opposite. The better question is, can we come to this kind of trust in Jesus? The stilling of the storm helps the disciples in their journey to the truth. They're struggling to try to put it all together, but this miracle reveals God's reign in a world of chaos. We live in a fallen world. It is affected by chaos and destruction and evil and hurt and sudden and violent storms in our own lives. And if we think that this means that if we believe in Jesus that, that we're not going to have any storms, you totally missed it. Every sailor will tell you there's no such thing as a stormless sea. But it's understanding who Jesus came to prove who he is. Because by knowing who he is, you also know what he's going to do. 
The book of Revelation, it scares us to death. We shouldn't be scared of that book. In fact, you know, do you know most of it is just pulling quotes and stories out of the Old Testament? And we come to these stories of these beasts and everything else, and we're like scared to death. Whoa! And we don't even realize they're in Ezekiel, and they're in Daniel, and they're in all these places. They, they, they understood what these things meant. But in Revelation chapter 1, it, it speaks of Jesus there in the beginning. And that he is in the midst of the lampstands. And the lampstands, it even translates it for us to let us know these are the churches. And he's like what? What does it say? The Son of Man. The Son of Man. He's clothed with a long robe and a gold sash around his chest. He's now giving a description. If we could, we, we would just read all of that. Because he's given the description of the Ancient of Days. And we see this, and it says Jesus is in the midst of the churches. But it did not mean that they would not have trouble. Revelation promises they will have trouble. He promises they are going to be persecuted and killed for their faith. But do you know what the book of Revelation is about? Victory in Jesus. That's what the whole book's about. And we come to the end, and we see all of these awesome things. One thing is, we see that, there, you know, the beast, one of the beasts that's going to be destroyed is one that came out of the sea. It's a, it's a beast of chaos and destruction. It goes on in chapter 20, and it tells us, that these things are going to come and Jesus is going to come again. And when that happens, the sea will give up its dead. It will. They can kill us on this earth. But let me tell you what. The God of order, the King, the Creator, He is coming. And everything that has been hurt, that has been harmed, that has been taken by the sea, it will be given up. For those who are in Christ. And then the last chapter. I don't know if you've ever read this or not. Folks. It's Genesis. It's the Garden of Eden. That language runs all through it. And he talks about the new heavens. And the new earth. And you say yeah I've heard that before. But did you notice this. When that day comes. The sea will be no more. Does that mean, well, the Atlantic Ocean is gone? No. Chaos is gone. Destruction is gone. Death is gone. All those things that have wreaked havoc in our lives by being in this fallen world, it will be no more when Jesus finally comes again. And we can trust that because Jesus came and he stilled the raging of the Sea of Galilee. I love art. I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I've always loved art. Um, and one of my favorite artists is Rembrandt. Rembrandt. Uh, I like him because he, he painted in this is 1600s and he painted in realism. Realism is, you know, simple. It, it's also very matter of a fact. It's, it's uh, these, these detailed scenes of nature and contemporary life and all of these things. And he painted the picture of Mark chapter 4. He painted the storm on the Sea of Galilee. That's the title of that picture. And you look into that picture, and, and, and I love this picture. And if we were closer, <laughs> I could show you things. But you got one guy, and he's up there, and he's just trying to gain some semblance of control as this wave is just crashing in over the boat. You've got, you've got this guy. I don't know if, oh, you can't hardly see him. But he's down at the very bottom. Does this, does this have a little pointer on it? Does this have a pointer? Oh, it does. Okay. Right here, there's a guy throwing up. Now, you don't, you don't see anything. There's no chunks. You know what I'm saying? But he's, he's, just, he's just over the boat like this. And you see all of these things. But here's what a lot of people don't realize. This is one of the cool things about Rembrandt. Is as you draw closer, you see this man who's looking at us. 
Rembrandt always drew a picture of himself into his paintings. This is Rembrandt. And he's holding on to a rope and his hat. And he's looking at us as Jesus is, is getting ready to stand up and, and to rebuke the wind and the seas. And if you know anything about Rembrandt, you know that his life was just wreaked with havoc, chaos. He and his wife, they had four children, but only one survived. It was the last one. The, the others didn't last more than a few months at best. And after the fourth child, the one that finally lived, it wasn't very long right after that that she dies. And then he's in these this kind of troubled relationships and he doesn't really get married again. It's kind of like this common law type marriages and 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 he's he he finds himself bankrupt. And what many people may not realize is here's Rembrandt. We say that name, all I have to say is Rembrandt, and people know who that is. Did you know that, that he was buried as a poor man in an unmarked grave? And the way they did it in that day and time, after 20 years, and this is what they did with Rembrandt, they took his remains and they destroyed them because that's what you did with the poor people. We don't even have the remains of Rembrandt. Something else we don't have is this painting. In 1994, I believe, uh, there was a heist at a museum in, in Boston. And two men who were who were dressed like cops, came in, and they took it along with 12 pieces, these millions of dollars worth of art. And to this day, they still don't know who did it. They've got an idea, no arrests have ever been made, and they've never found the painting. And it's like, man, we can never lay our eyes on the original painting. That would just be so cool to see. I would love it. But the Jesus who who stilled the storm. He's not gone. He's coming back. He went to a cross. He went to absolute chaos. And he went through the chaos. And he rose from the grave to show us What's going to happen when the sea gives up its dead? And he says, I'm coming again. He sits at the right hand of God, the Son of Man. He is coming again. We just, we trust him. We allow our faith to continue to grow. Listen. Listen. It's hard in this world. Here are these guys that walked with Jesus and listened to him, and they didn't quite even know who he was. And even while we now have the way of being able to read these things and to see them and to study them and, and all of this kind of thing, even, even at that, we still... It's sometimes really hard in this world. Our faith will be shaken. And we just keep asking the question, who then is this who can control nature? You see, they had seen him heal people. They had seen him cast out demons. But you know, in our world today, we can go out here and in various religious circles, they'll say we're having a healing service or this one over here, we can exercise demons. But have you ever heard anyone say, listen, here comes this hurricane and then when it gets, gets to our coast, when it gets to Vero Beach, I'm just going to walk out there and I'm going to rebuke it. And it's just going to calm. No. No one does that. Because only God, creator and king of the cosmos, only, only God can bring order to chaos. Trust him. We've already won. The problem is the sea just continues to make us think that it hasn't. 
I don't know where you see yourself in this painting. If you're the guy up here, you're just trying to hold on, or if you're down here and you're begging Jesus to get up, or, or if you're the person that's, that's Rembrandt and you're just looking because you, you're just like, I know he's coming. I don't know. But I am going to do this. We're going to pray. Right after this prayer, we're going to have a song of invitation. And there's things that you may be ready to talk about, you want us to pray about. There may be some things in your life that you're really struggling with. You're in a real storm right now. But you know what? You're not real comfortable just, just, just throwing it out there for everybody either. Listen, if, we can, if I can pray with you after, if your elders here can pray with you after, if some of these women here can pray with you, listen, you do that. There's power in that. There's power in that. So let's pray. Father, we come to you this day and we thank you for your son. Father, we praise you for, for stealing the storm. Father, we thank you for sending your son to die in our place. Father, we thank you for your spirit who rose him from the grave. But Father, we're still here and these storms are still raging and there are people that may be in here right now. I don't know. Father, you know. And I just pray a special prayer for them. And if they're in here, they know exactly who they are. Father, rebuke whatever it is, whatever chaos is in their life, and just bring them to peacefulness. And even if whatever it is that they're dealing with in their life right now, or maybe they've been dealing with for a long time, Father, just give them an inner peace that can only come from your Holy Spirit. Father, I just pray that you, you place this upon them. Help us, Father, for our faith. May it grow and expand. And may we trust you. And Father, it's in the name of your Son that we pray these things. Jesus, Messiah. Amen. If we can help you in any way, come.